Now, you're all doing the EPOG program, so I know you're more critical of mainstream economics than most students would be. But the mainstream has been dominated by this idea of the Lucas critique that uh, argues that we really need to uh, build models straight from microeconomics up. And the essential thing they see is, have, can you read that at the back? Barely? Good vision. OK, good. OK, uh, is that they say the structure of an econometric model consists of the optimal decision rules of agents. And just to give you a, a bit of a, a, a comic element to this, uh, I'm giving much the same presentation to the Bank of England in a couple of weeks' time at their invitation. And the chief economist said, please explain as carefully as you can the behavioural elements of your model. And I told him, I get my results with linear behavioural functions. In other words, behaviour is unimportant. I'm going to show you why. Well, what you get out of this whole tradition was very complicated DSGE models. Has anybody here analysed a DSGE model in detail? Incredibly complicated to derive. Actually very simple finally, but very complicated to derive. And to make them meet uh, the, the, the model of the economy, they force equilibrium on what actually is an unstable, mathematically unstable system. And it's all driven by the behaviour of agents. If they can explain cycles at all, it's due to exogenous shocks, and then the cycles persist because there are deviations from perfect competition. That's really the essence of their models. And the only policy they provi provided was to use modify interest rates, vary interest rates, to bring about a convergence to the uh, long-run desired rate of economic growth. And before the Great Moderation, um, they thought the Great Moderation itself was a sign their policies were working. And I love this quote from Ben Bernanke in 2004, where he says that he, he said there are many arguments as to what is causing the Great Moderation, but he thought improved control of inflation has contributed to this welcome change to our economy. So they really saw their policies as causing an improvement in the state of the economy. Then the crisis hit. And um, I now want to take a look at the crisis of 2007 and also the Great Depression, because when you take a look at them empirically, you find they both had declining volatility before the crisis. We only have two data points to go on in terms of decent statistics around economic crises, but here is the rate of inflation and the rate of unemployment during the 1920s to the 1945. And what you can see is this huge cycle in inflation caused largely by the return to the gold standard, but then a trend towards deflation and all the way through from 27 through to about 30, prices were falling. So there was deflation before the crisis hit. And you had, notice also these declining cycles in unemployment. And by the time the National, this is using uh, National Bureau of Economic Research data from this point on, you can notice a sudden change there. The NBER's recorded level of unemployment in October 2029 was zero. Okay. To one decimal place, the unemployment rate, which was recorded by seeing who was registered for unemployment was zero. So that's the great, then you see an explosion in unemployment, inflation becomes extremely high deflation, prices falling by 10% per annum for two years, then a period of return to a bit of inflation, falling unemployment, and then back to rising unemployment and back to deflation again in what's called the Roosevelt recession. I think if I had to say where we are right now, comparatively, I'd say we're about here. This is our crisis now. So this is, this is again, far, far, more, far finer data. You have a trend towards falling unemployment and then bang the explosion to unemployment falling prices, and then sudden deflation in the aftermath of the crisis. Now we're back at deflation again. For a short while after the crisis, I think due to the scale of the rescues, we had a period of inflation. So that's, those are the two data points. Now, they also, and this is the thing that neoclassical economics ignores, they also had the phenomenon of rising private debt followed by deleveraging. So this is the red line is the ratio of private debt to GDP. And you see it rose from about 50% of GDP to 130%. This is normal, this, this is data which I've taken from the census, uh, United States Census, and made consistent with the, uh, re federal, the, the uh, federal Reserve flow of funds data. I had to drop the level quite significantly to make the two match. 
I'll explain that if we need to talk about it later. So if you look in the recorded data, you'll find a higher debt level, but this is normalising it based on on 1945 and subsequent data. The blue line is the rate of change of debt on an annual basis as a percentage of GDP. And what's, what's where, what they experienced back then was a substantial period of deleveraging where private debt was actually falling as a percentage of GDP by about 5% per annum. Then it rose a bit and then it fell again when that other crisis hit. So that's the dynamics we're looking at empirically. Um, this is our period. Here's a rising, this is the level of private debt starting at about 90% of GDP, peaking at about 170% shortly after the crisis, all the way through debt growing faster than GDP until the crisis hit with a slowdown and a period of deleveraging. We're now having Americans borrowing money again, running at roughly the rate of about 6% of GDP per annum. So that's the empirical data. Now, I'm going to argue that the whole DSGE program was a complete waste of time. It's not how you should model capitalism at all. It's the, the model of, of, a, of a stable equilibrium system subject to exogenous shocks, which is the Frisch paradigm from the 1930s where econometrics began. It ain't capitalism, not by a long shot. What I prefer is to say we actually have to look at the structure of the economy as giving the dynamics we see. So this is a wonderful quote from Marx, I think the 18th premier of I bring you over to Louis Napoleon. Men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. Uh, they do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances already existing, given and transmitted from the past. Which is one way of saying you have to understand the actual physical structure of the economy to do your model. And I think the behavioural modelling that the neoclassicals emphasise is absolutely crucial, is far less important than getting the structure of the economy right. And the key parts of the structure that I'm bringing into modelling are money and debt, which are completely left out of neoclassical thought. Now, the Bank of England appreciates that these days, which is wonderful, but I'm now going to persuade them that they should drop the DSGE modelling and go across to the approach I'll show you here. And what I've done is effectively build a model of the financial crisis using strictly true identities. Uh, so the tr art model is at, at the level of the point from which I start working out the model, it's true regardless of what the agent behaviour is. I have to model agent behaviour at some point, but the actual model starts off as being true. And what I found, which was, when I first did it was unexpected, this is talking back in 1992 when I first built this model, is that a model with only three variables in it generates both the Great Moderation and the Great Recession as two phases in the same process. They're not independent, they are actually the same dynamic process. And that's even if you have incredibly simple linear behavioural functions. Of course you're more realistic with, un with non-linear ones, but the actual structure turns up even with linear behaviour. And what, uh, in, in terms of the literature on complexity and chaos theory, it's following what's called the inverse tangent route to chaos, and I'll show you that in a moment. So to me the key issues in modelling capitalism properly, of abandoning the fixation on equilibrium, and bringing money, strictly true, strictly properly bringing money into the, into the modelling system. So when I did the Minsky model back in 1992, then published in 95, this was the dynamics that it gave me. This is the employment level up the top and the wager share down below. There's just screen grabs from the Journal of Post-Keynesian Economics article. And what you can see is strong cycles here, parent diminishing cycles, falling wages share, so workers getting less of output, so rising inequality, and then increasing volatility on the other side. When I graphed it in the three dimensions, that's the, the dynamics. The third dimension is the ratio of private debt to GDP. I remember when I first showed it to one of my supervisors, he said, Steve, if you've uncovered anything that is actually real in capitalism, we're in deep, deep trouble. I realised how correct he was now some time later. And what I, I finished off with what I saw as a rhetorical flourish in the paper saying that the chaotic dynamics in this paper should warn us against accepting a period of relative tranquility in a capitalist economy as anything other than a lull before the storm. And I wrote that in 92, August of 1992 as it happened. So before the mod Great Moderation was actually empirically identified by neoclassical economists, I got this effect. And what I want to show is that th this actually is something fundamental to the structure of the model. When I did this model, I used nonlinear behavioural relations because that made sense to me. But I had a lot of neoclassicals tell me that oh, you only get these results because you have exponential functions. 
And I basically use an Australian term, I said bullshit. That's not the case. This happens because of the structure. So I thought I'd illustrate that to you by using a linear function. And it may be this is giving you something that's actually innate to capitalism. Uh, so I'm starting with three strictly true identities about employment, income and the debt ratio and then model them with the simplest possible structure I can put around that. So the identities start by saying that this is talking is in percentage terms. So the percentage employment uh, rate will rise if economic growth exceeds the sum of growth and labour productivity and population growth. That's simply, simply definitionally true. Wages share of output will rise if wage demands exceed the growth and labour productivity. That's also definitionally true. And the third one, it actually took me a while to realise this because the, the actual equation was quite complicated, but in fact I worked out it very recently. You can just reduce it to this very obvious statement. The ratio of private debt to GDP will rise if private debt, debt grows faster than GDP. Which is another obvious statement when you put it together. Now there's nothing about that that lets you work out what's going to happen in the economy. You simply have to simulate and see what happens. This is putting it as equations. So lambda is my term for the employment rate. Omega, wages share of output, and in little d, the debt ratio. And that one there, that's the employment rate. That's the rate of economic growth in real terms there. There's labour productivity and population growth. And then down here, there's the wages share of output. Those are wage demands. In the initial model, I'll show you are real wage demands. And then finally, the debt ratio. And that's the rate of growth of private debt. So that's, all that stuff goes together and to form the models. And I've got some other stuff. I, these are just showing that the, all the identities can be expanded. So if you just take any of these terms and work through the calculus, um, basically product rule work, you'll end up with exactly those equations. So it's a definitionally true set of statements. Now, Putting in the simplest possible model, I, as I said, I, mentioned, I get all these phenomena that we saw in the real world turn up. Rising private debt, rising inequality, and also finally a breakdown. So the model starts off by saying output is simply a linear function of the capital level of capital. Of course you could be more complicated than that. You should be, but you don't need to be, and that's my point. Investment is a linear function of the rate of profit and depreciation. Employment is a linear function of output and wage change a linear function of the employment rate. And then change in debt simply being investment minus profit. So I have no Ponzi behaviour at all in this model. All the money being borrowed is being borrowed to build real capital. No government sector, no Ponzi finance and importantly no bankruptcy. So this is, this is what Yanis Varoufakis once described as an Austrian economist's wet dream. Yeah? This is a world where everything, all contracts must be obeyed. Uh, where there's no bad behaviour by capitalists whatsoever, no bad behaviour by bankers, and no government sector to stuff things up, and even arguably no trade unions. So that's the linear output. You just have output is capital stock divided by the accelerator. Investment uh, is net of depreciation, and investment is simply a, a linear function. There's a, there's a target rate of investment where capitalists invest exactly their profits. Above that level they borrow money, below that level they pay their debt down. Uh, profit is net of wages and in, in, in debt servicing costs. Employment is a linear function of output, so I simply say the level of work, uh, employment is output divided by labour productivity. The wage rate is therefore um, equal to, the wa wage level is the wage rate times the number of employed workers. And the Phillips curve is simply a linear Phillips curve. Again, simpler than it needs to be, but just to make the point that you don't need to be complicated to get these results. And then finally, change in debt is investment minus profits. And that's been empirically verified by FAMA and French, of all people. So that's the simple system. Now what you get is a model which, when I put it in all the uh, algebraic terms, it has only three variables. So that's the three variables there, the employment rate, the wages share of output and the debt ratio. There are nine parameters. Constants, in other words. And those are the nine there. One of the rate of interest and the others are the slopes of the investment function, population change, uh, growth rate, uh, the technical growth, uh, labour productivity growth rate, depreciation, and uh, what's the other one there? That's pretty much it. Okay, nine parameters there, and the, uh, then V and so on. But what you get out of it is the phenomena we know from complex systems that a three-dimensional system can give you complex behaviour. 
very, very simple model, which that is. Uh, can give you incredibly complicated behavior. And what it fits is known as the pomo manaville route to chaos. So to show that, this is where it might be worth uh, moving forward if you can't see the logic. This is my Minsky software, which you can download for free from, uh, from SourceForge. And I'll bring up one of the graphs and I'll make the graphs a bit larger. That's the employment rate. And this is the worker's share of output, which is a proxy for the um, rate of inflation as it happens. And now if I'll just start simulating those. So it's the, 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 these, these statements you see here are ex exactly those differential equations stated as I showed you on the board a moment ago. So you can just, whenever you design a model in Minsky, you can go and check the equations instantly. Over here it shows you what the equations are that you've drawn in that sen sense. So let's just start the simulation. And what you get, there are a series of cycles in employment and the wages share of output where wages share is declining over time. The employment rate appears to be stabilizing, so the cycles are getting smaller. The debt ratio, which conventional economics ignores, is rising. If this goes on for long enough, those cycles, which are still diminishing, as you can see here, and workers' share is still falling, so inequality is rising. Now you notice the cycles are starting to become the same scale. It's still diminishing there, let's see. It hasn't quite got the rising stage yet. Debt ratio is still rising. We're at about 70% of GDP right now. I've got to leave it running at that speed. If I go back, and it'll, it'll start the simulation again. So let's just let it continue a bit longer. But a conventional economist looking at that would only be looking at this. They'd be seeing this as falling inflation. And they think, oh, the economy is reaching stability, that's fantastic, and the inflation rate's falling, that's also fantastic. And this is irrelevant, let's ignore it. Okay, here we finally get to the point. And note, remember this is a simple system with linear behavior and only three equations in it, three parameters. So it's doing something that conventional economics doesn't believe is possible, which is having both a diminishing set of cycles and then a rising set of cycles in the one system with no exogenous shocks. Uh, come on, <laughs> I wish I'd made it slightly faster than that. Okay. I'm tempted to go back and restart the simulation. That's been running for how long have I got it so far? That's running for 140 years so far in simulated time. <laughs> well, you waited for me on the cab, you can wait to see the simulation work as well, I suppose. Let's see. Come on, hurry up. I, I, don't, I haven't chosen the wrong, I've, I have chosen the wrong values, pardon me. That's the equilibrium one. I will speed it up now. That's the equilibrium. So it can reach equilibrium. There are two possibilities. I'll show you that in a moment. Okay. I'm being frazzled by the car. Now I'm going to change the reaction function for capitalists so they react more aggressively to the rate of profit. Let's just go back and start the whole thing again. And now look at what happens. So the same basic pattern. You see diminishing cycles there. And again, you'd think everything's wonderful and work is getting less of output, which you don't care about. Rising debt, which you also ignore. Now the cycles start to increase in, 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 in scale. And then ultimately the system will have, it's got booms and, bump, booms and crashes getting bigger and bigger. And there'll ultimately be a total crash and the economy will collapse. So that's, that's the model with no, all, all it is is a structural model. With no special things about the behavior of the economist, economy at all. But you get in some senses the basic outlines of what we've been through empirically in the economy in both the Great Depression and the most recent crisis. So that's graphing at the slightly more complicated model where I show the rate of growth of debt slows down and then accelerates on the other side. That's the basic dynamics there. All these presentations are embedded in the PowerPoint, by the way. So if you want to download them and run them, you can do that. Just 
download and save into your own machine. So what is this is the phenomenon there in terms of complex systems is what's known as the, as the inverse tangent route to chaos. And the way it was described by the people who first identified it in fluid dynamics is it's a dynamic process which you can model as being a process bouncing between a straight line and a curve. Now if the straight line intersects with the curve, there'll be two points of intersection. Downhill will be a stable equilibrium and uphill will be an unstable one. But if, you, if the curve doesn't intersect, then you appear to have smaller cycles, which means in this case the water appears to be flowing more smoothly, and then suddenly it starts to flow in a turbulent way. And that's, if you, so you have an intersection, there's, a, there's no turbulence. In non-intersection, you get turbulence preceded by apparent stability, and that's exactly what we've been through in the economy. So in some sense, I see this as identifying a, a very deep element about the, the economy you could never find out from conventional equilibrium thinking. So there's the equilibrium progression in employment and the profit rate and the debt ratio. Here's the exactly the same system, though that's the, and that's what you get there for is in three dimensions you get this convergence to equilibrium. But if you take the, the more unstable approach, which appears more like the actual data we've seen, then you get cycles falling and then rising in employment. The same thing happening in the profit rate and a level of debt that, rise, that appears to stabilise but then rises in a very volatile way. And when you rough that in three dimensions, this is the shape you get. And that's the shape which my supervisor said looked like I'd identified something very scary in capitalism. He was right. Okay. So what you've got is diminishing volatility in employment and inflation with a rising debt ratio and increasing inequality. And that increasing inequality is a strict identity because profit in the model reaches a, cycles around an equilibrium or reaches an equilibrium if you have the stable set of conditions, which means that banker's share is directly inversely related to worker's share. So a rising level of debt means a rising worker's share and therefore a diminishing, the rising banker's share and diminishing worker's share, even though there's no borrowing by households in this model whatsoever. So the workers pay for the high level of debt being borrowed by the capitalists I think both in this model and in reality. So that's model, that's as I've shown you model, uh, and there's another way of modelling it, that's a reduced form I've shown you a moment ago. But you can also do a causal flow chart, this is what I'm showing here, it's exactly the same model, but done as a causal flow chart. This is where you might find it beneficial to be closer to the screen, but that's, up here I'm starting up with the, the level of investment determining the capital stock, which determines output, which determines employment, which gives you the Phillips curve, which determines wages, subtract wages from profit, you get output, you get profit, that determines investment, and if investment exceeds retained earnings, you borrow money, which is detract, subtracted over here to give you profit net of interest payments, and back you go again, and when you simulate exactly the same dynamics I've shown you a moment ago, diminishing cycles followed by rising cycles and breakdown. So the weakness of that model, of course, is that you get booms and busts on both sides. And the reason was I didn't have a price equation inside there. So what I'm now going to do is generalise those identities to include inflation. So having an employment rate doesn't change because inflation turns up on both sides when you've got nominal output minus uh, uh, the equalising terms inflation cancels out. But when you look at the nominal, wage, nominal wages now, then you have money wage demands, not not real wage demands anymore, which is more realistic. And that's going to be the wage, wage share of output will rise if money wage demands exceed the sum of inflation and growth and labour productivity. So you've got to include inflation inside there. And the private debt ratio will rise if the rate of growth of nominal private debt exceeds the sum of inflation plus economic growth. So I need additional equations for the rate of inflation and for a variable nominal interest rate. And again, I use the simplest possible relationships. I've got a lag convergence of prices to equilibrium and a lagged inflation premium on interest rates reacting to that. So here we go. I've got to improve my graphics there. Um, but what I, what I get is an equation that looks like this, which is, says inflation is minus 1 over a time lag uh, multiplied by 1 minus the wages share divided by the worker's share of output. Now, that's a bit complicated. I'll, I'll explain where I get that from. So what I've done, another thing you can do with Minsky is model a monetary system. And I've built a monetary, little monetary model here where I have 
Again, this is whether I, I wish I had a larger um, screen to work with here. Oh, wait, what is it? Okay. Why is that not being deleted? Ah, bug in the, bug in the program, pardon me. Uh, what I've got going on here is uh, prices being driven by the gap between supply and demand, straightening a classical looking concept. So there's a convergence so that the nominal uh, value of demand is equal to the nominal value of supply with prices doing the equilibrating. So neoclassicals would think that gives you equilibrium. I'll just illustrate this model. If I run it, you'll notice that there's, over here I've got the, the black line is money demand and the red line is the monetary price of output. And they converge in this simulation very, very rapidly. I'll just go back and do one or two steps, let's see. So within, in this case, within uh, about one-tenth of a year, with the prices converging at the rate of the time lag being four years, within one month effectively the prices are in equilibrium. And neoclassicals often think that if you make the adjustment faster, that's more realistic. It'll happen, you'll get to equilibrium faster. So this is prices adjusting rather than once every uh, four years, they're adjusting every, every month. And this is what you get. Okay. You overshoot. It doesn't, having a rapid uh, convergence does not give you rapid convergence to equilibrium. It gives you instability. But that's just a buy the buy. I'm looking forward to demonstrating that to the Bank of England next week. I think I'll get a surprise. But that's, that's the basis of deriving the pricing formula. To show, show you that, I'm basically saying the rate of change of prices is a time lag multiplied by the gap between supply and demand in monetary terms. And that's the same as saying there's going to be a convergence to an equilibrium price level. So I have a monetary value of physical supply, which is the price level times quantity of output. And that's equal to the price level times labor times labor productivity. Again, just doing a straight expansion. The quantity produced is labor times labor productivity. And labor is the wage bill divided by the wage. It's all very simple stuff. So the wage bill is worker's share of GDP. I'd say there's a certain amount going to workers and a certain amount going to capitalists. I don't have much going to bankers in this system. And GDP is the turnover of money in the economy. So you have a, a rate at which the money supply is turning over. When you do substitution of all that, you get an expression finally that says that the price level is a time, time lag multiplied by one minus worker's share of output uh, divided by the capitalist market, the basic capitalist markup, which is Kolesky's pricing equation. So it drops out very naturally, even using a neoclassical um, way of deriving it, you get Kolesky's pricing equation. Uh, and with inflation, uh, you also have to have an interest rate that adjusts according to the rate of inflation. So this just has inflation. The rate of interest is the base rate you know, set by the Federal Reserve plus an inflation premium if the inflation is greater than zero. Otherwise, it's just the base rate. So there's a, there's a flaw to the interest rate there. And I have a nominal wages formula, as I mentioned, and a nominal debt formula. So it looks a lot more complicated now, but it's still an incredibly simple model. So this part here is saying that the inflation adjusted nominal interest rate. That's the inflation uh, time lagged uh, basis of inflation being determined. Inflation affecting the wages share and in fact affecting debt growth. And there's finally a lagged reaction of the banking sector to the, uh, to the rate of inflation in terms of the interest rate they set. So you put all that together and you get that model and this is what I find this is what I, I find quite remarkable I'll just actually hang on a sec go back and simulate that I'm supposed to have I meant to have a Minsky model turning up there what did I do with it let's see okay so this is the whole model I've just explained to you I know this is ridiculously quick and you can as I said take the slides and work through them slowly but those equations I mentioned a moment ago are over here in absolute rather than relative terms. And if I simulate this model, I'll bring up the employment rate, which is one of the useful ones to show. And the inflation rate. Let's see. 
Okay, and I'll bring up the debt ratio. So let's look at those three. I think I may have stuffed up that model. Let's just see what happens again. Oh, great. Pardon me, I'll just have to, I'll start this model again. Obviously, I've, it's very sensitive. The Paulette here can actually accidentally bring some things down. I must uh, get Russell to redefine that. So I'll just give me a second to load it back again. Oh, great. <laughs> Let's try it from over here. I'll do it first of all without bringing out one of the larger graphs just to show you the dynamics actually work. Good, that's okay. I know it's, you, can you see any of that at the back of the room? Or is it impossible? Let's bring up the graphs and see if that makes it easier to follow. There's the employment rate. There's the inflation rate. And this is the debt ratio. So now let's stop that and start it again and then graph each of those. And what you get is this period of the cycle. This one is employment. This is the inflation rate. The cycles appear to be diminishing. You'd think you've got an economy going well. Then, without warning, they start to rise, which to me is a bit like the uh, stagflation period. Low inflation, but uh, occasionally periods of high unemployment. Inflation has now fallen into deflation. The debt ratio is still rising. Then the cycles start to diminish which is a bit like the great moderation again. And you might think, oh great, the economy is stabilising. And then this happens. You get a total collapse. Yeah. And funnily enough, the last people to know that's happening are actually the capitalists. Because if you look at the profit share, what's actually going on is the profit share is looking like it's stabilising because workers' share of output is falling. Ah, I must already, that's workers' share of output there. While bankers' share is rising. And one is offsetting the other until deflation gets to be so strong that the rate of decline of wages can't compensate for the increasing amount going to bankers and finally profit share collapses. I mean, profit share there. So I carry on that simulation a bit further. The capitalists are the last to know that capitalism is coming to an end. So that's uh, that a free market system isn't quite as wonderful as a lot of Austrians might believe it is. So when I, when I put this in four dimensions, this is the sort of dynamic you see. This is a, another simulation run, but very similar overall. Declining cycles, increasing cycles, declining cycles again, then collapse. The same thing for the inflation rate. This is a linear model, by the way, so that's why inflation gets to be so low. The profit rate, same story. Capitalists are the last ones to know. And this rising level of private debt to GDP, which again is ignored by the mainstream. And graphing it in th three dimensions, which shows on the vertical axis the, uh, the private debt ratio. Those are the linear dynamics. The nonlinear system, again, looks like you're reaching stability, then the system collapses. Inflation, same sort of story, but now inflation stabilises at a lower level because you don't get workers accepting enormous wage cuts. Profit rate, again, without, again, without warning at the end, everything seems wonderful, then it collapses. And what's being ignored is this debt ratio. And you put that together in three dimensions, that's what you see.
So I think it's a fairly realistic model of capitalism, partly because it's derived, derived from identities, which means that you can't challenge the underlying logic without challenging identities, which is rather hard to do. And if we hadn't had this phenomenon of the great moderation followed by a crisis, you might dismiss it and say, well, it's feasible, but it won't happen. Well, it has happened in our lifetimes. And of course, I'd say it's happened twice with the Great Depression as well. So you have this period of tra tranquility and then a breakdown. And the mainstream can explain neither. I think this model explains both. Now, one important thing about it is this idea of profit share cycling around in equilibrium and with the declining worker share offsetting a rising banker's share. Uh, and of course, the mainstream theory doesn't care about workers getting less. That's the, their marginal product is falling. Why should we complain about that? Uh, they're not realising that there's a crisis coming their way. So this is graphing the income distribution dynamics up to the very end. And you can see capitalists are bouncing around in equilibrium, nice and comfortable. Uh, workers declining, bankers rising, and then finally when the exponential effect of deflation kicks in, the whole system collapses. There's the equilibrium profit rate. And one important point I'll bring up in a moment. Now, this is the nonlinear system. And one thing people don't appreciate is that your equilibrium is not your average with the nonlinear system. By bringing in nonlinear behaviour relationships, the equilibrium rate of profit, as you can see here, is above the level that actually applies. So you don't using you can't use equilibrium and averages um, interchangeably in a proper dynamic dynamic model. So that's capturing what the mainstream is completely. And the key thing I've brought in there is the role of private debt. That's what they leave out, as well as thinking in equilibrium terms. And what they, when you are, when you challenge, and I saw apparently Bernanke was challenged on this front on hard talk a couple of days ago and dismissed the importance of private debt even after the crisis. Uh, but this is him writing back in 2000 saying, private debt is just a pure redistribution. It should have no significant macroeconomic impact. Now that's on one side, of course, post Keynesian literature has been dominated by the importance of endogenous money in the last 30 or 40 years. But most post-Keynesians still don't see a role for change in private debt as part of demand because they believe in the expenditure income identity. And you may have seen a paper in the Review of Keynesian Economics recently where Brett Feiberger critiqued me in, in, in the same edition and said that unless I can explain how buying a good doesn't provide income for the seller, then I should rethink my claim that debt extension can, can force and inequality between expenditure and income at the aggregate level. So you're saying I made an identity mistake there. Well, I did rethink that and I'll show you the rethinking in a moment. But what they're leaving out, what the mainstream is leaving out, and also I think post-Keynesians who haven't quite integrated this yet, is the role of new money in creating both new debt and new, new income and new demand. And the, this is uh, my good friend Paul Krugman um, saying that banks don't create demand out of in there any more than anybody does by choosing to spend more. They're just an intermediary. So the opposition that the mainstream has to what I'm arguing is the loanable funds model. And in loanable funds, uh, banking is just an intermediary between savers and lenders. There's no uh, savers and borrowers. There's no um, instrumental role for the banking system. So this is Krugman again saying when debt is rising, it's not the economy as a whole borrowing some more money. So there's no relationship between borrowing and money in that model. It's just less patient people uh, borrowing from more patient people. That's um, in his uh, paper, his book, End this the Depression Now. And in fact, if, if, this was, if they were institutionally correct about the nature of banking, that would also be correct to ignore debt. And I'll show you why in a moment. Because um, what they've got is banks not lending. So this is Eggertson and Krugman's DSGE paper in 2012, and that in the appendix to that paper, they had a, they, what they called a banking system. It didn't bear any resemblance to what I call a bank, but that was they called it a bank. And they had a patient consumer agent lending to an investment, uh, impatient investment agent, and the investment agent paid interest to the consumer agent, and the bank charged a fee for introducing the two. A bit like an Ashley Madison of finance. They both then hire, what, I, what I've done is I've taken this and put it in a Minsky model. So I have them both hiring workers, buying output from each other, selling to the workers and to the bank in the system, and then the investment agent changes how fast uh, it, it borrows or, uh, and repays uh, money to the, to the uh, consuming agent. And the dynamics show there's actually no particular impact. So this is the overall, showing this as a double entry table. I have lending 
in, in the, the standard I use in Minsky is that flows are from a positive to a negative, which is the same as what engineers use in electronics. So I have lending going on here from the consumer agent to the investing agent and the liabilities for the banking sector are shown as negatives. So that's, that's partly why you'll see this logic here. Repayment this way, I think I've got a couple of those. So that's lending. Um, and notice there's no sign of this. This is looking at the economy from the point of view of the bank. So the bank has reserves, uh, deposits of the investment sector, deposits of the consumer sector, workers' deposits, and the bank's own equity. Debt doesn't turn up there at all because debt's neither an asset nor a liability of the banking sector. So you've got to see, look at the consumer sector from this point of view to work out where's debt because in this model the debt is an asset of the consumer sector. Now notice lending here uh, says if you lend money then the cash you have at the bank goes down. That's sensibly a negative sign on the asset side. And the asset you have of a, a debt the investment sector owes to you goes up as a positive. So that's, that's showing the logic in a set of interlocking tables. And when I model this system, I can vary the rates of lending and rates of uh, repayment as the simulation runs. Notice the growth rate is zero. Um, down here I've got the, the red line is the level of money, the black line is the, the debt level. If I have the, lend if the banks lend much more rapidly, notice growth dipped a bit, and if lending happens uh, re repayment slower as well. Ah. I've unfortunately brought a couple of extra symbols. Pardon me, I'll have to... Let's just bring back up that one again. I've got to move the palette. It's too easy to make that mistake. <sighs> okay. So I'm, if I increase lending rate, notice the debt level down here rises compared to, to the amount of money in the economy. And if repayment happens more slowly as well, debt rises even more rapidly. Tiny changes to the growth rate, which is basically zero. If debt repaid rapidly and lending happens much more slowly, the debt level collapses. Again, there's really no change at all to the activity in the economy. So you can ignore debt. That's, that's the thinking they have. But what if banks actually lend money? What happens if you take that into account? Well, Minsky lets you make a very rapid set of changes here. So I can go to the consumer sector table. And I can say, well, debt's not an asset of the, banking se of the consumer sector. So I can delete that as an asset. And the financial transactions aren't between the consumer agent and the investing agent. They're between the bank and the investing agent. So once I delete these here, I can now go to the banking sector. I haven't done a complete set of changes. There's more. To be totally correct, I've got to make a couple more changes there, but just for the sake of speed. I'll just make that set of changes. Then I add in an extra column here and say, what, what existing liabilities are still there in the system? Because I've deleted the debt as being an asset of the consumer sector, but it's still a liability of the investment sector. So that brings across the operations for, uh, for lending and repayment. And if I now say interest, are actually, interest actually is paid to the bank, and delete this silly column about uh, having a bank fee, And now reset the system and start it again. Now what I've got effectively is endogenous money. So banks lend money. That's the only thing I've changed in the model is to say that banks actually lend money. And what you get is a positive growth rate. You can see the growth rate's above zero there. Hang on, so have I done that properly? Let's just stop it again. Okay. Ah, and I've got too low a level of lending. Let's go back to the level of lending I had initially. So you have the money supply is growing and because the debt is growing, lending money does create new debt. Uh, lending, money creates, lending, lending creates new money and new demand. And that's the point I want to explain in a moment. If lending slows down, 
then the growth rate will plunge and the economy will have a recession. If repayment slows down, to be, so that ends up growing, you're back into a revival again. So you can have a boom and a slump in the economy courtesy of changes in the rate of lending. That's the importance of modelling endogenous money, which the neoclassicals leave out. So changing the debt level does matter. This is now when I've included the endogenous money system. That's the result you get. So logically behind this, it must be in somehow, some way, change in debt is turning up as part of income and demand. So I want to explain why that's consistent with the arguments about expenditure being identical to income. So imagine, just imagine a three sector economy. It doesn't matter what they are, I'm just calling it sector one, sector two, sector three. And I'm going to show expenditure which is financed by money rather than debt in capital letters and expenditure financed by debt in lowercase letters. And I'll look at three situations. One is where you can't borrow money at all, which is classical no money doesn't matter world. Uh, the second where there's borrowing from other sectors, which is loanable funds. And the third where you can borrow from a bank, endogenous money. And the first case you might call Say's Law, but it's actually in reverse. Demand creates its own supply. So you put a table up here, I'm showing um, expenditure this way and receipts the, the other way. Net income is vertical. So net income for sector one is expenditure by sector two on sector one plus expenditure by sector three on sector one minus what sector one spends on sector one, sector two and sector three. So the nets can be different to zero, but as you can see, each row sums to zero, okay, and the whole table sums to zero. Now the, the negative of the diagonals is aggregate demand. The off-diagonal elements are aggregate income. So there's the expenditure by each sector, and there's the receipts by each sector, and they're necessarily equal. And you work it out, expenditure is identical to income, which is not exactly a shock in that particular case. You look at loanable funds, then there's going to be sector one will borrow a little amount, little b, from sector two, which means sector one's spending power rises by little b, and sector two's spending power falls by little b. So you've now got a plus, uh, plus b turning up here, or a minus b, and plus b over here, and equally offset by a minus, a plus b down here, and a minus b over there. And if you take a look at the, the aggregate, what you find is that um, again, there's no sign of change in debt turning up in loanable funds. But what if you borrow from a bank? If you borrow from a bank, looking just at the liability side of the bank here, you've borrowed plus B from the bank, there's no offsetting amount of minus B from any other sector. So in your sum of aggregate demand, you get change in debt turning up as part of aggregate demand, which is the sum of the, the negative sum of the diagonals and the sum of the off-diagonals also includes change in demand. So an increase in debt causes an equivalent increase in both expenditure and income. So the only way to really interpret this sensibly is say that aggregate demand and aggregate income are demand and income from the turnover of existing money plus demand and income from newly created money. And it generalises to when you look at a flow of new money over time as well. So now it's considered DDDT, a rate of change of debt with respect to time, which is dimensioned in years. And when I put that together, I now have my, my S1 and S2 and S3 are now bank deposits effectively. Uh, so S, if, if I divide the amount of money in a bank account by the rate at which it turns over, then I've got the spending by that sector out of existing money. And I've got, I've got to have a bank equity table in there as well to show payments to the bank. I know this is un unintelligible even for people on the front row here, but when I sum up aggregate demand and aggregate expenditure, I find there are three components to it. There are the bank accounts. That's the sum of spending out of existing money, which turns up here. Change in debt turns up both in income and expenditure. And so do gross financial transactions. Not net, but gross financial transactions turn up. So both aggregate demand and aggregate income, when you look at in endogenous money terms, is non-debt debt, debt finance, so that's turnover existing money, plus the change in debt, which is creation of new money and demand and income, plus gross financial transactions. So you can integrate change in debt without violating expenditure as identical to income. You've just got a different source of expenditure. So what you get is again generalizing Friedman's static um, um, 
monetary equation. He simply had price times output is equal to the velocity of circulation times the amount of money. When you generalize this, you actually find he's left off DDDT, okay? plus the rate of change of debt, plus gross financial transactions. With rate of change of new, new debt being far more important, of course, than gross financial transactions. And change in GDP therefore includes a term that has acceleration of debt as well, which is why we find the, inc the, the incredible stats I've found over time of the strong relationship between acceleration in debt and change in GDP. So you have to have a, a monetary vision of capitalism, which is what neoclassicals don't have, what post Keynesians are on the way towards developing. And it's an enormous omitted variable to leave out private debt. And that's why they didn't see the crisis coming. It wasn't that it was unpredictable, it's they left out the major force that causes crises. So to give you some of the illustrations here, um, the level of debt we're talking about, this is America's, again I've mentioned I've normalised this private debt data. The, the public debt data is actually available from the White House and goes right back to uh, 17, 1790. But to make this series I had to take um, Federal Reserve data from 45 forward and then match it with where it overlapped with census data from 1834 forward. That's the best estimate I can find of the level of private debt. You can see these are the previous peaks. We are well beyond in that sense the previous peak of private debt in 200 years of American capitalism. And when Godley began warning about the crisis at that point, that's when I started to warn about the crisis. And we're still all being ignored, which is bizarre. When you look globally, you find this tendency is, is in fact a global uh, phenomenon. Anybody tell me which country this is? Japan, okay? It's the first one to do it 20 something years ago. 1990 is when they had their crisis. Uh, we've now got ourselves to the same basic situation globally. And when you look therefore at the rate of change of credit, what you find for Japan is that credit growth actually maxed out at about 27% of GDP in 1990 and then plunged down to the stage where for most of the period from 1997 on, private debt's been reduced in Japan. There's been deleveraging. And every time the economy appears to recover, and they think they can drop interest rates or raise interest rates or cut back government spending, they fall back into private sector deleveraging again. The only country with massively growing private debt right now after the crisis is China. And that's about to come to a screaming halt. And now when you look at the relationship of change in debt to the level of unemployment, this is the Japanese data from 19... I've only got it going from 1980 here, but I actually have it going back to 1960. But from 1980 forward, the correlation of the change in private debt to the unemployment rate in Japan is minus 0.89, yeah, which is supposed to be zero according to conventional, conventional logic. For America, the correlation from 1990 forward is minus 0.93. So that's the red line is the change in debt on an, as a percentage of GDP on an annual basis, and the blue line is the unemployment rate. And again, asset markets are also affected by this. We, we can't separate finance and economics anymore. That's a, a nonsense thing we fell into from a, a neoclassical point of view. But far from, neoclassicals argue that debt plays no role in setting asset prices. In fact, it's the main determinant of asset prices. So this is showing the correlation of margin margin debt and the S&P 500. I didn't expect that correlation to occur because my causal relation is between acceleration and margin debt and change in the S&P. But America is so massively caught up in gambling on asset prices that the correlation between the level of the S&P and the level of margin debt as a percentage of GDP is 0.96, which is just ridiculous. Uh, here's the correlation of margin debt and change in, uh, change in margin debt in the S&P 500. That's 0.69. The one that I saw as the causal relation is the acceleration in margin debt and the change in the S&P. So we're talking a second order change variable in economics related to a first order, a first differencing. It's ridiculous to get correlations like that, about a 0.53 correlation. Similar thing for the housing market. This is a correlation of acceleration of margin debt and change in the American house price index. And over 25 years, the correlation there is 0.77. So, and of course, I've shown you a causal argument behind that correlation. So, I think what we face globally is pretty much we can extrapolate forward what's happened in Japan. This is taking 
Japan's data and moving it forward 18 years. So Japan's crisis therefore coincides with our crisis. So if Japan's the, the canary in the coal mine, what is the canary telling us we face? Well, they reached a peak level of about 225% of GDP as their private debt level. It then fell to about 175% and since then it's been maintained at that level. So I think the Japanese economic policy hasn't reduced private debt. That's what they need to do to grow again. Instead, they're stuck in a stagnation trap. And you look at what that means in terms of credit growth. This is taking change in uh, debt in, in, in Japan and extrapolating that forward. I think we face a very similar history, to, future history to this. The credit growth, rather than stimulating demand, is now going to be mainly reducing demand. And we're seeing that already applying in a fair bit of the Western world. But I think it's going to get worse over time. So the only one that's actually growing is China and that's got a crash. It's, it's grown far, far faster than even America and Japan have. And just to give you an idea of that, this China began its borrowing binge in the aftermath of the financial crisis. That was their way of avoiding the impact of the financial crisis on the economy. So this is looking at the ratio of private debt in, in China starting in, in 2009. The Japanese crisis began, a bubble began in 1970. So this is the black line is Japan's private debt to GDP ratio starting in 1970. And America's began in 93, the most recent bubble. So that's the blue line is America starting from 93. And you can see Japan got to, China's got to a level of private debt to GDP that exceeds the, re, the maximum that America reached in total and is equivalent to what took Japan 17 years, it got there in six. So with that rate of growth of debt, it's got to have a dramatic rate of slowdown as well. And funnily enough, the leverage issue also turns up in the stock market here. They have had a previous stock market crash back in 2008 during the financial crisis. It was actually a bigger crash than they've had so far, but margin debt back then was zero. There was no margin lending. Margin lending began in mid-2010. And when it began, the level of margin debt as percentage of GDP using the Shanghai Index was 0.00014% of GDP. Trivial. It reached about 1% of GDP um, about eight months ago. It hit over 2% and is now back down below 1%. So China is gambling at a far faster rate than even America has done and getting out of it incredibly rapidly as well. So there's a lot of volatile days ahead for, for China. And again, looking at that acceleration relationship I showed you, there's no particular relationship back here, you might think. But you can see the higher the level of debt gets to be, the more volatile, the more impact changes in the acceleration of margin debt have on change in the index. And over that period from 2014, the correlation of uh, acceleration in margin debt with change in the index is 0.69. And since the beginning of this year, the correlation is 0.87. So phenomenally strong confirmation of the impact of private debt on the economy. So my, to finish on a policy note, I think, and I'll be arguing this with the Bank of England in a couple of weeks' time, the only effective way out of this is to, is to reduce private debt. And if we rely upon the normal mechanisms of capitalism to do that, it'll cause a great depression. So you have to find a way of cancelling a lot of that credit-based money and replacing it with fiat-based money. And what's been called people's quantitative easing, or PQE, is one way to go about that. We could use the state's capacity to create money, to put money directly into our bank accounts, regardless of whether people are borrowers or, or savers. So you don't favour people who are in debt. But those who are in debt must cancel their debt. So you'd reduce it directly to reduce private debt. Or those not in debt get a cash injection, so they're not penalised. This would reduce asset prices as well, which would make housing more affordable, and give us more of a credit, more of a, of a fiat-based economy, less credit-based, and then stop banking financing Ponzi schemes because we need banks to create money, but all they're doing it to do right now is to finance asset bubbles. You can't really borrow money from a bank to finance a business, let alone finance entrepreneurs. Um, so I've got two ideas I suggest there. One I call the pill for property income limited leverage, and that is to say that there's some maximum loan factor that can be given to buy a property related to the rental income that property can be expected to earn. So say you have a factor of 10. Uh, for example, the house I'm living in in London, I'm paying, what am I paying? 
18,000 pounds a year to rent it. Well, with my rule, the maximum anybody could borrow to buy it would be 180,000 pounds. Now, I'm sure that's well below the price it would sell for. But it would mean people would be competing with each other to save money rather than competing with each other to get a higher level of leverage from the bank, which is how people now win a contest over, um, over who's going to win a property. The person who takes up more leverage wins today. We have to make it the person who saves more money wins the property. And I'd meld venture capitalism with banking because we, I think we need private bankers or pr the private sector to be making decisions about financing new ventures. I don't want bureaucrats to be doing that. I'm happy to have bureaucrats decide on large scale investment projects like the CERN accelerator and things like that, but not in individu individual entrepreneurs because they're too afraid of, bureaucrats are too afraid of making a mistake. So I'm proposing we bring in something like Islamic finance as part of banking, not the entire banking, but part of it, with what I call entrepreneurial equity loans, where the bank would make a loan to entrepreneurs and take an equity stake in the business. And of course, maybe four out of five are going to fail, so the bank loses its money. But the fifth one hopefully makes a fortune and the bank makes a profit on all five. So to make it possible to mend venture capitalism with, uh, with banking as we have it now, and I think the main barrier to all these ideas I'm talking about is the moral perception we currently have of debt. And that comes out of us having a, an interpersonal view of what debt is. And if you borrow something from a friend and don't repay them, then effectively you're robbing, robbing them of money. Somebody has to save money to give you money. That, um, one of my ex-students owes me $15,000, for example. Okay. I helped him out through a divorce. I'm $15,000 poorer. Okay? I'm not going to get it back. Uh, but bank loans, if you borrowed that money from a bank, the bank would simply say, here's $15,000, and by the way, you owe us $15,000. So that would have been the bank's mistake to lend to this guy. Okay? So it's not a moral thing at all not to pay back a bank loan. We have to think about it very differently. Banks simply created too much money for the wrong reasons. So we should have a system for writing that off rather than having a moral argument that you should always repay it. And the problem is we think of banks as warehouses, which is the loanable funds view. And I still don't think non-orthodox economists have got used to this enough at all. They're actually money factories. They can overproduce money and debt, and that has systemic consequences, and we have to do something systemic to eliminate the damage that does to our societies, which uh, we're a long way from doing it. So we're letting them create asset bubbles, uh, we're letting them fund Ponzi schemes. And we need to get away from that to have banking, to tame banking and make it less of a dangerous element in capitalism. But an essential part of this vision is something Minsky said a long time ago. And he said that he saw capitalism as being fundamentally flawed, subject to booms, uh, crashes and depressions. He said this instability is due to characteristics capitalism must have in order to be consistent with, banking must have to be consistent with full-blown capitalism. And in a sense, I've shown you that because I derived a Minsky crisis with no Ponzi finance, no irresponsible lending by the banks, just simply responding to what firms wanted them to invest in. And you still get a crisis. So you can't define that away. So we simply have to cope with that being part of the nature of capitalism. And at that rate, I think I probably sp I spoke faster than I got the train across here. I'm sorry about the speed I speak at, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Today we're discussing um, Professor Keane's uh, work on the role of debt in capitalist monetary economies. Um, the structure of the presentation is as follows. Um, firstly, we're gonna, just gonna look at the limitations of neoclassical economics, followed by a discussion of in endogenous money, uh, Minskian insights and the role of debt. Um, the final section includes some critiques of Professor Keane's approach followed by some questions we have for him. Um, regarding the limitations of neoclassical economics, um, the micro foundations of neoclassical economics can be understood as a major theoretical limitation to the school, as pointed out by post-Keynesian approaches, which highlight the significance of micro-macro paradoxes, such as the paradox of thrift. Um, okay. An example of the mainstream's uh, perspective in this regard is, is summed up well by a quote from Krugman, uh, 
um, where he says, Econ economics is, is about what individuals do, not classes, not correlations of forces, but individual actors. This is not to deny the relevance of higher levels of analysis, but they must be grounded in individual behavior. Methodological individualism is of the essence. Furthermore, neoclassical models function in a world in which agents are hyper-rational, acting on perfect information, um, where, whereas post-Keynesian approaches regard agents as social beings influenced by class, history and institutions, and operating under fundamental uncertainty. In terms of methodology, neoclassical models focus on static equilibrium analysis, whereas post-Keynesians highlight the relevance of disequilibrium and trying to, to bring um, and try to bring in dynamic analysis into their study. Most importantly for today's for the topic of today's presentation, neoclassical economics departs hugely from post-Keynesian economics insofar as it ignores its relevant issues of money and credit. And now uh, I will continue with uh, explaining the difference between the exogenous money creation and the endogenous money creation approach, uh, mostly discussed by post Keynesian economics. Uh, mainstream economic approaches typically emphasize the nature of the money supply as exogenous and created under the full control of central banks by the process of money multiplier. And the main logic of exogenous money creation is that banks need excess reserves uh, before they can make new loans. And in this process, first deposits are made, creating excess reserves, which allow banks to make more loans, which in turn create more deposits. And exogenous money creation constitutes one of the essential features of the neoclassical ISLM framework. Regarding uh, endogenous money, as emphasized by post Keynesians, the central idea is that banks create money through granting credit, which simultaneously creates deposits. And if banks have insufficient reserves to back the loans, then they are granted increased liquidity by central banks. Therefore, uh, central banks provide these reserves because without them, banks would uh, consist consistently run into uh, liquidity problems. Financial instability hypothesis uh, is one of the central theoretical constructs to Professor Keane's work on the role of debt in capitalist monetary, monetary economies. And financial instability hypothesis posits that Financial instability is inherent in monetary capitalism. Periods of prolonged prosperity will cause the financial system to progressively increase its leverage, return rates and risk expo exposure, proceeding through the stages of hedge finance onto speculative and finally Ponzi finance. And with the outbreak of the uh, global financial crisis, Minsky's financial instability hypothesis entered into <coughs> economic debates in many circles. For example, uh, Krugman attempted to model Minskyan insights with the neoclassical tool set. And in our opinion, this quote from Minsky uh, explains well the reason why neoclassical economics would fail to explain the inherent instability in capitalist economies. And the quote is, the abstract model of the neoclassical synthesis cannot generate instability. When the neoclassical synthesis is constructed, capital assets financing agreements that center around banks and money creation, constraints imposed by liabilities, and the problems associated with knowledge about uncertain features are all assumed away. And for economists and policymakers to do better, we have to abandon the neoclassical synthesis. Now we will discuss the central part of today's presentation, which regards the role of debt in capitalist economies. According to Professor Keane's 2011 edition of Debunking Economics, according to Professor Keane, there are three factors uh, 
which are essential to understand the effects of debt uh, in a capitalist economy. They are the level of debt, the rate of change of debt, and the acceleration of debt, which is the rate of change of rate of change of debt. And these are all measured with respect to the GDP. Professor Keane posits the first indicator shows the aggregate burden that debt imposes upon society. Since the level of debt is a stock variable, while the level of GDP is a flow variable, this ratio tells us how many years of income it would reduce to uh, debt to zero. But as Professor Keen uh, points out, a target of zero is neither feasible nor desirable um, since some debt is needed to sustain entrepreneurial innovation. Um, but at the least, the ratio indicates how debt encumbered an economy has become. The second indicator Professor Keen discusses is the rate of change of debt. In this regard, um, Professor Keen posits that aggregate demand in a credit-driven economy is equal to income plus the change in debt, which is expressed in this equation on the slide. As a result of this analysis, one can interpret aggregate demand as far more volatile than it would be if income alone was its source. This is because while GDP changes relatively slowly, uh, the change in that can be very sudden and extreme. Um, therefore, this indicator signifies the amount of aggregate demand that is the result of rising debt. And the change of uh, debt is interpreted in two ways by Professor Keen. Uh, firstly, increasing debt may be acceptable when it finances investments on the one hand, but uh, it can be unacceptable when contributing to aggregate demand through a significant dimension of Ponzi finance. The third dimension of the role of debt in uh, Professor Keane's work regards the acceleration of debt. Taking the change of the variables in the previous equation, um, Keane posits that the change in aggregate demand is equal to the change in GDP plus the acceleration of debt, or the change of the change of debt. From this, Professor Keane argues that the acceleration of debt determines debt's impact upon the rate of economic growth, and hence the change in the rate of unemployment. For Professor Keane, the acceleration of debt is the best leading indicator of whether employment and the economy are likely to grow in the near future. Um, now we, we would like to present um, some critiques directed to Professor Keane's work from other post-Keynesian authors. Uh, Lavoie and Pally represent Professor Keane's arguments with, relation with, with the equation on the slide here. Um, accordingly, if there's a positive difference between the present period's aggregate expenditures and the previous period's realized aggregate income, this, di this difference will have to be financed by an increase in debt. Aggregate demand is then equal to the previous period's income plus the change in total debt multiplied by a velocity of circulation variable. Um, and one of the, the critiques that uh, uh, Lavoie uh, makes in this regard um, relates to the velocity of debt um, insofar as if, if, if this uh, velocity variable in this equation is not treated as constant, um, which it is not according to Professor Keane, then the equation becomes a truism or a tautology where V becomes identified after the fact as a residual. Uh, the second critique we look at regards Pally's assertion that Keane's equation deficiently assumes agents always and invariably plan to have expenditures equal to the previous period's aggregate income unless there is a change in the amount of debt in the economy. Therefore, Pally notes, that Keane ostensibly reduces changes in effective demand to changes in the amount of debt, excluding other post-Keynesian factors like the distribution of income, for example. The third critique relates to what seems to be double counting in Professor Keane's schema, since investment and consumption as components of GDP can be financed by, by credit or debt. This seems to pose um, a problem when, when considering 
Professor Keane's equation that aggregate demand equals GDP plus change in debt. Um, we now have some questions for, for Professor Keane. Um, we have eight in total, and we don't assume that uh, you will necessarily have time to answer all of them. So we will ask them in the order of, of importance we placed on them, and hopefully you can respond in the order in with which we, we ask them. Um, the first question is, how do you respond to the criticism that your equation on the relationship between debt and GDP involves double counting? Um, the second regards um, that you say that you saw the, the Great Recession coming, and in your schema, how does one assess at what level the, the private debt becomes untenable? The third question um, is, how does one assess what share of debt is used to finance real investment versus Ponzi activities? Um, and the fourth question is, can you explain how your two statements, aggregate demand is equal to GDP plus change in debt, is not contradictory with um, another quote, a return to growth won't be achieved until debt levels are substantially reduced? Um, and our next question is, how is it possible to run a central bank without understanding how mon money is actually created? Uh, do you think that do central banks know the truth, but just uh, t just take a political view uh, on these questions? And our next question is, in your opinion, what is the applicability of the financial instability hypothesis to the global financial crisis, given that the core of the hypothesis centers on the non-financial corporate sector? Do you extend the scope of Minsky's financing taxonomy to the household sector in your models? Um, another question is, what exactly is your criticisms of Bernanke's handling of the financial crisis? What would a central banker who is a proponent of endogenous money uh, have done differently if in charge of the Fed during the Great Recession? And our last question is, how was it possible for Rubuni operating in a new Keynesian framework to predict the Great Recession? Does this indicate the possibility for new Keynes in economics to integrate theory around over-indebtedness into their models? A lot of good questions there. First thing I'll start with saying is something that you should always hear academics say at some stage, and that is, I made a mistake. Okay? Um, but the mistake was also part of getting an intuition that was correct. So when I, when I first was working in this area, uh, I, I first had Basil Moore give a presentation at my university, which is then I was uh, doing my PhD at the University of New South Wales, and I found Basil's argument very persuasive, and we, he and I became good friends ultimately, of course. Uh, but but um, to me, if endogenous money mattered, it had to have some impact upon aggregate demand. So my shorthand became aggregate demand is income plus change in debt, and. The only two people who, only one person who agreed with me on that front was Michael Hudson. And Michael's not at all mathematical, but he, he actually challenged me once. I was staying in, in, in uh, New York and he just said to me, uh, we were working on a paper, what is aggregate demand? And I said, it's income plus change in debt. And he said, why can't other people see that? Well, other people didn't see it because they think in the strict accounting sense that expenditure is identical to income. Okay? But that's the way I first expressed it. And Throughout it, I was trying to find a way of putting that insight in a sense that was correct and would also make sense to post-Keynesians. And a lot of my attempts were trying to show the time sequences that apply when you're looking at a flow of, of new money. So if you, have a, if you imagine the amount of money in the economy as being like uh, water being turned in a, in a tub, so you've got a, a paddle and you're rotating the amount of water in the tub, and then if you're pouring new water in at a particular point, that's the volume of water that's moving past a particular point that gives you total demand. And before you reach where the tap is pouring water in, demand is at a certain level and income is at the same level. You get on the other side of where the water is pouring in, demand's at a high level and so is income, and the transition is caused by the change in debt. And I went through an, many, many ways of trying to express that, and I never got something which I could get through to post-Keynesians because they used what they call period analysis. Has anybody here done a model involving period analysis? T and T minus one, that sort of thing? Don't 
do it. Okay? Uh, to me, the, the, one of the major reasons why post Keynesians have had such a struggle in trying to implement thinking about the role of money in the economy is they use this thing they call period analysis, where you have it is T, period T and P, T, period T minus one, difference equations. You'll see it throughout Godley and Lavoie's books. Almost every post Keynesian model, not all of them, are done in what's called discrete time. That is why I think it's been so hard for post Keynesians to get their head around this. Um, so I, I finally realised in my reply to that uh, debate with Feiberger and, and Pally and Lavoie to uh, stop trying to put it in period analysis and just put it completely in continuous time. So to go to that part of the argument, let's see the questions I was asked here. Hang on. First one, the double counting. Double counting appeared to happen because when I said income is, is equal to, expenditure is equal to income plus change in debt, then I had, I was taking an identity and adding one term on the one side and not on the other. And that looks like double counting. And strictly speaking, yes, it is double counting. There's a mistake there. Okay? Uh, it only turns up when you think in period terms because where do you put the change in debt? Okay? Does the change in debt happen in this period, in next period, or in the transition between periods? Now, in fact, when, I, when you work in continuous time, it happens at the transition between periods. And there's a very good paper by uh, Giuseppe Fontana. If you look back on the, all the book articles about the nature of endogenous money, Giuseppe points out at one point that everything interesting seems to happen between the two periods. And what I was trying to do was get an insight, which actually is something which, strictly speaking, if you work in period times, happens between the periods. Now that means the interesting stuff happens where you don't analyse. So to me, I really want to convert all of you to thinking in continuous time. Throw away this idea of a T and T minus one. Work with DDDT, DXDT. Work in continuous time. Because then you don't have that problem at all. And the reason I brought up that spreadsheet a moment ago is I want to illustrate something with the spreadsheet as well. If I can just make that a bit larger, let's see. Let's go for... Uh, Try 100 percent see how that works. Okay. Think back. To, uh, what, what, hang on. I finally reached a, pr a proper definition of, of the of the relationship between change in debt and demand and income in a paper coming out in this month's review of Keynesian economics. Should be out the very next edition of the review. We'll have my reply to Furbiger and Pally and Lavoie, and I know, I know that I've got it mathematically correct. That's where I developed that table analysis I showed you of dividing the economy into three sectors and then showing the identity of aggregate demand and aggregate income and a role for change in debt in both aggregate demand and aggregate income. So that's, in other words, I'm, I, I, took, I, I, had, I had an intuition which was correct, but my expression of it was, was false and it was difficult to communicate it until I've got to this final stage. So lots of mistakes are made. That, in, in doing economic theory and working out a model. And that's, that to me, I, th I think it's a reason to be hopeful yourselves because um, when you see an academic paper, you see something which might have taken five years for somebody to develop their ideas in. They've made mistakes like crazy for the previous four. Okay? Um, unfortunately, I, my mistakes were all in print because I did it in the internet age and I did it through blogs. So you can see all the mistakes I've made getting here. But I'm very confident with that paper in the review of Keynesian economics. And then I want you to think, think in terms of, imagine you're looking at uh, a river and you're seeing the flow of water in a river. If you have a measurement done at some point in the river, the hydraulic engineer will say, the, the hydro hydrologist will say, water is flowing at the rate of, say, 2,000 megalitres per year. Okay? Taking an instantaneous measure at one point, 2,000 megalitres per year. What that translates as, if the rate of flow of water continues at this speed for a year, then in a year, 2,000 megalitres of water will pass this point. Okay? That's dimensionally correct. If you then say there's a pipe pouring in 100 megalitres of water per year into the, the t river at a particular point, then on the other side of that, you'll get 2.1 megalitres of year pouring. Now, what you're adding is the rate of flow of water, which is dimensioned in litres per year, and you're adding the injection of water by a pipe, which is also measured in litres per year. Okay. Well, the same thing applies with money and debt. If you have the turnover of money in the economy, giving you GDP, that's turnover of existing money, 
So that's your demand and income created by circulating existing money. Then when the change in debt comes in, that is also dimensioned in dollars per year. So our, our GDP measure is like measuring the river. Our change in debt measure is like measuring the injection of water into that river. So you can dimensionally quite accurately add the measure of GDP as a, as a measure of the rate of flow of existing money and the change of debt at a particular point as the measure of creating creation of new money and demand and debt at that point. So that's what I'm doing with this little illustration here and that comes back to part of your question about what's the critical level. Because what I've got here is a simple illustration of imagining GDP in a particular country growing smoothly at 10% per annum. And so I'm using China as my example there effectively. 10% rate of nominal GDP growth per year. And I have debt starting at a Let's just start debt at, say, let's say debt's, um, say, 50% of GDP, and it's growing at the same rate as the economy. And then you have the rate of change of debt slowing down to zero in the final year. Well, what you would have in that situation would be a debt ratio remaining constant at 50% of GDP, change in debt every year being 10% of GDP, which is 50,000 first of all, then 55,000, 60,000, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the final year stabilizing. And what you get in terms of adding up the turnover of existing money, which is what GDP is measuring, it's plus the change in debt, which is what the, the, the change in debt is adding to demand, then your growth rate would go from being 10% per annum to 5% per annum. Still positive. But if you have say a debt ratio of 150% and you've got debt growing at the same rate as GDP, so no change in the overall debt ratio, and then the rate of growth of debt slows down to zero, and then in that year your demand, your rate of change of debt goes from being plus 10% to minus 3%. So simply stabilising the level of debt is enough to cause a crisis in that sense. Now if you look at the type of situation we've actually seen in China where you, your debt level may have started at say 50% of GDP way back in um, 2008. Well, let's make it 100% which is pretty much what it was. Um, and the debt ratio was growing at say, let's make that 15%. Does that get me there? No, we're going to make it 20%. Still not there, let's go for 25%. So if you had if you have, take a look at, say, China, starting with a debt ratio of 100% of GDP back in 2008, GDP growing at 10% per annum, so no, the GDP is completely independent here of change in debt, which is simplifying things, obviously. And you have debt growing at 25% per annum, then after about four years, you have a debt ratio of 200% of GDP, which is pretty much where China is right now. And then if you have the rate of growth of debt simply slowing down to being the same as the rate of growth of the economy, you'd go from a rate of growth of 14% to a rate of growth of minus 8%. That's still with debt growing. If debt actually stabilises, so debt ceases growing, then you go from a 14% growth rate in one year to a minus 23% the year after. So this is indicating that the danger level for debt is something of the order of 150% of GDP or above. Because at that level, relatively tiny changes in the rate of growth of debt or even let growth go to debt stabilising and becoming the same as the rate of growth of GDP can cause a huge crisis in the economy. So that's partly answering your question about the scale of the scale of debt. Just let me look at a couple of other questions there. Um, so back to the I'll go back to the yeah the the, the the intuition I had was correct, the expression of it was wrong, but I'm glad I trusted my intuition because I, I didn't get to the stage where I had to throw change of debt out completely. I had to find a way of revising how I stated it, but I was correct. Change in debt plays a huge role in aggregate demand. So I try, suggest you stick with your intuitions. If you find you have a problem with something and your intuition and your logic don't quite work out, trust your intuition and continue working. Um, the period analysis has said get rid of it. It's something which you'll find in so many uh, post-Keynesian texts. Don't reproduce it work out how to express it in continuous time instead. And then with continuous time analysis, you can do much more, you can understand capitalism better and you can do much more sophisticated models of capitalism than you can with uh, continuous time. So the level of the crisis is uh, inevitable. Is anything above 100% of GDP? 
is going to be a trouble level. I, I think the level of debt shouldn't be more than about 50 to 70 percent of GDP. In that range, it's small enough that changes don't have that drastic impact. So if I modify this, for example, and say we've got, let's say we start from 50 percent here, and the level uh, rate of growth of debt, say, is slightly more than GDP, then a slowdown in the rate of growth of debt in that particular case goes from a 10 percent rate of growth per annum to a 7 percent, still positive. So you want, change in, you want the level of debt to be not so high that it amplifies the impact of change of debt that dramatically. Um, share for real investment. Um, I've actually, I'd better take a look at your question again if I can just see that properly, it's okay. Okay, so uh, point four, um, that's a good question. I'm saying aggregate demand is GDP plus change in debt. Uh, well, the aggregate demand is circulation of existing money plus new debt coming in. Um, it's not contradictory with it in the sense that you can get growth coming out of change of debt, but the danger is the accumulation of debt at the same time. Pardon me, seven minutes, Mintol here. Uh, so you have to, if you reduced debt by the conventional methods of capitalism, by bankruptcy and by trying to pay your own debt down, you'd end up in a huge slump which is where Greece and Spain and co are right now. So we have to find a way of reducing it without causing that slump, and that would use the government's capacity to create money by running a deficit and financing that by central bank purchases of government bonds. That would reduce the debt without reducing demand. So that's why it's not contradictory. Let's see. Page down, where are we? Oh, thank you, okay. And how is it possible to run a central bank and not understand how money is created? It's simple, just to a degree in economics. Uh, I, I have had, as, as a, a guy who's one of the, he's the chief economist for the Minneapolis Fed, I think it is, he's become a sort of a Twitter friend, a guy called David Affogato. And David uh, challenged me when I said, there are no decent neoclassical models with banks, debt and money in them. He sent me a paper to challenge my views. Money in this model, I am not joking, money was coconuts. Money literally grew on trees in this model, okay? So what they've got is an incredibly elaborate model in their head of the world, which involves nonsense abstractions, fantasies, not, not simplifying assumptions, but abs abject fantasies. And they know how that model works, and when you ask them a question, they answer how the model works, not how the economy functions. And they genuinely do not understand how money works. You get, you get a handful of people who can comprehend it, like, for example, Michael Kumoff. Have you seen Michael Kumoff's name? Michael was an economist with the IMF. He's now a chief economist for the Bank of England. He was a banker before he became an economist. He said he knows he's created money. He's made loans. He's created money. He's seen it happen. So he has built, he's, he's built uh, actual money creation and endogenous money into DSGE models and he gets dramatic effects out of it as well. So he does understand it, but he's definitely in the minority amongst neoclassical economists. Most are very happy to imagine that you can model money as coconuts um, or other bizarre abstractions like that. And they, and they simply do not understand money creation even though they run a central bank. Now the one exception there, thank God, is the Bank of England, which is getting much, much better on that front. European Central Bank right off and the same for the Federal Reserve. Um, when extended to households, it amplifies the results I'm showing here because in this, in this model, all the borrowing creates new capital equipment which is creating the capacity to repay debt in the future. When you include bank uh, household borrowing, households are borrowing money and driving up house prices but they're not creating more productive workers or more productive capital. So you get a debt, bur you get a debt servicing burden with no additional capacity to finance that. It simply accelerates how fast a crisis occurs. And when I bring Ponzi finance into my models, as I have done, I get a faster crash. That's all on that front. And how did Rabini, oh, criticism of Bernanke, um, he was called an expert on the Great Depression, and that's why he got the job as Federal Reserve boss. He is not an expert on the Great Depression. He's an expert on explanations of the Great Depression that are consistent with neoclassical theory. And the only explanation that's consistent is it's all the Federal Reserve's fault. Okay? That's his entire explanation. And what he does in that, if you look at his papers analysing the stats at the time, he critiques the Federal Reserve for the decline in M2 
I think it's an M2, it might be M1. But he critiques the Federal Reserve for, for allowing the fall in M2 to, M1 or M2 to occur. Now the data for M0 is available, which of course is the money strictly controlled by the Federal Reserve. When you graph the two, you find that there's a correspondence, a correlation between M0 and M1 and M2 in the 1920s, completely breaks down in the 1930s. So the Federal Reserve is trying to boost the money supply by boosting M0, and the money supply was falling, which was the results of the banks and the borrowers deciding not to, not to create money. So completely misunderstanding the Great Depression. And he, yes, he, he did what his theory said he should do, which is drastically increase reserves and make sure banks don't fail. So give him some credit for that. But he called his book The Courage to Think, uh, to, to Act, I wish he had the courage to think outside the box of neoclassical economics, which he still hasn't done. And Rubini, I'd mentioned St uh, Stigler there, not Stigler, um, Schiller there as well, Robert Schiller. And these are simply people who are more realistic. Rubini would not call himself a new Keynesian. Rubini would call himself an economic historian. And he just simply looked at the data, looked at the scale of the bubble, did a bit of back of the envelope calculations and said there's got to be a big crash coming out of that. And he had the guts to stand up and say it in conventional economic conferences, which takes a lot of courage because you get derided and ridiculed by people who are in your audience. And it's very intimidating. So hats off to Nereal for doing that. And Robert Schiller, the same thing. Robert put his neck out and said there's bubbles in asset markets, bubbles in the stock market, bubble in, in housing and warned of the crisis in, in that same sense. And that took a great deal of courage. So they, they are able to look beyond the box they're living inside, which is a, you know, more credit to them. But they are still, to some extent, inside the box. Now, Schill has moved substantially outside by getting into behavioral economics, which I'm not particularly a fan of, but at least it's more realistic than neoclassical economics. Rubini has always been somebody who looks at the global megatrends and things like that. And again, as I said, it's the courage not to be constrained by your training. Uh, I hope in your case you'll have the courage to be constrained by your training and do decent economics. Okay. So we are taking questions. Um, thank you very much for your lecture. I have a question that uh, in 1930 in America there was a division between an investment banking and the private banking. Mm. And I know that now it's been discussed on the European level on the and American level to mm. re-implement this practice. Mm. And could it help to fight these bubbles or there should be stricter regulations on the private banking uh, in terms of loans? Yeah, thank you. I, I think it's a... Uh, yeah. I will ask to... to oh, okay, ask so... <laughs> questions and then you... Okay, my question is concerning uh, money creation, uh, but not this bank money creation, maybe money creation by civil society that is also possible and uh, we can see in examples. Uh, so I want to know your comment, your point of view on uh, alternative currencies and uh, community currencies. Which banking again? Uh, alternative and com community currencies. It's not the banking. But um, it's a civil society creation money. Bitcoin, um, Bitcoin and things like Bitcoin that. Bitcoin is a. Bad example, something like uh, v, um, Veer Bank in Switzerland or um, Time Banks in United so Kingdom. So community banks and things like yes, that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thanks. I had two questions. Firstly, clarification. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to know what exactly the meaning was of the turnover and velocity of debt. I think is the term that's used. Because presumably that's not just uh, expansion of new credit. Because I mean, if I borrowed from a bank and then didn't spend it, presumably that wouldn't be adding to to aggregate demand. So just if you can explain that concept. And then secondly, with the Minsky models, I'm just uh, wondering if you can maybe give a sense of how we get from the simulations to uh, actual kind of historical analysis. Because uh, it seems a little difficult when. Uh, when all you can do is base on a set of uh, presumably assumed or somehow empirically estimated parameters, get a whole range of different uh, uh, simulations without going through the normal procedure of, of uh, analytical development in the model to narrow down kind of specific causal mechanisms. It's kind of hard to see all these spirals and to think how now do we go look uh, at a real economy and see these dynamics of work. So if you can talk a bit about the methodology involved there. Yeah, I had a, a, a similar question, um, and I think this is 
it sounds like you're trying to pitch this model to central banks. And I was wondering if you could kind of just run through the argument that you would make to a central bank for why this could replace the DGSE models. Um, I, I can see how there's a lot of intuition here that would be good for policymakers, particularly like government um, government rule setters and like for Congresses and parliaments. But I'm wondering for the day-to-day -day operations of a central bank, um, what exactly is it that the model can add to the um, the intuitions that were already developed by Minsky? Which it's very similar to Niles' questions as far as what is sort of the operational value of being able to have this mathematical model yep. for these ideas? Yep. Okay. I take that lot or? Okay, yeah, that's a good set of questions there. Um, private banking versus investment banking, that separation. Um, if that was all you had to do, then the problem could be reformed away. And that's why I built a model where there is no um, bad behaviour by the banks in terms of financing asset bubbles and you still get a crisis. So I think the, the, separating investment banking from private banking would improve things to some extent, but it wouldn't eliminate the possibility of crises. So I think we have to go beyond that, that alone. Like in that sense, Glass-Steagall is good but not enough by a long shot. And we, if we were going to make it work, we'd need to match that with policies about writing off debt in a systemic way when crises occurred. Um, simply saying you, if you separate the creation of, of uh, money for transactions from the creation of money for investment, that'll solve the problem, it won't, in my opinion, so it's not enough. Um, Bitcoin and community banks, uh, a lot of time for those sorts of institutions because uh, the community banks, because they, they have to know who they're lending to. If you go back to the stage of small community banks, they, they normally know who they're actually making a loan to. They can assess whether the person's a lunatic or a, a genius to some degree and that's a large part of why Germany has been so successful because they still have a very strong system of community banks. A large part of the money creation is done by those banks rather than by big agencies. I, I've seen it, just got a document sent to me from an Australian bank ra um, really bragging about the fact that they can now approve a loan in under 10 seconds. Okay, well, I reckon that's a reason to be shut down, not to be congratulated. So they're literally just, you type a set of numbers into a spreadsheet and they'll give you an answer back as whether they'll give you a loan or not. Of course it's for a mortgage, okay? It's so you want lending to be f providing working capital for genuine firms or investment funds for, for real firms and there you need to actually know who you're talking to if you're gonna do it through banking. So definitely a lot of time for it. Again, I don't see it as a complete solution, but it's certainly a better nature of banking than what we've got ourselves evolved to. Turnover and velocity. The velocity equation I used in that night 2014 paper was wrong. That's a mistake. I was trying to work this in period terms and I, I stuffed up there. So throw that one out the way. But when you think about uh, how debt actually turns up in a double entry bookkeeping sense, if you negotiate a loan contract like a mortgage with a bank, then the bank will give you a right to borrow up to some amount of money. It's like a line of credit. When you then purchase the property, that amount of money, let's say it's 500,000 euro, is transferred from your deposit account to the uh, purchaser account, and that cr creates the $500,000 debt you owe to the bank at the other time. So until you actually spend the money, it's not manifest as being debt you owe the bank. So if you, if you negotiate a loan contract with the bank, you don't actually, they give you a loan account, which can be up to 500,000 euro, but there's nothing in there at the beginning. When you actually make the loan, then that money turns up in the, in the seller's account, transferred out of your account, and your debt appears at the same time. Equally, think about a credit card. If you go shopping with a credit card, when you swipe the card, that debits your account and credits the seller at roughly the same time. Slightly earlier for the debt, of course, okay? That's, I was trying to use those timing issues initially. But that's, the, so the, to actually create the debt you have to spend in the vast majority, nobody, very few people borrow money and then leave it sitting in an account and pay interest on it, okay? You've, you've got it there to pay out over time or you access it in dribs and drabs over time using a line of, what is effectively a line of credit once the loan's been approved but it's actually the spending that generates the debt. So there can be a minor difference between the two, but I think it's trivial compared to the overall volume that mainly you, when you, debt is manifest by spending it into existence. Agree or are you looking puzzled? 
processing. Well, the, the, when you, if you borrow money from a bank, you, 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 well, like you negotiate a loan, you don't, sorry, further up? Yeah. You don't set it up in such a way. Okay. Okay. Yep. Oh. Okay. You don't set it up in such a way that you take the money and don't spend it and pay interest on it when you haven't spent it. If you, if you think about a company like Tesla, uh, taking out, say, a billion dollar loan to finance the building a new um, battery, uh, battery uh, factory, they're not going to be paying interest on the billion until they've spent every little bit of it. The loan contract will say, we, once, once we access, we pay on what we've accessed, and here are the terms on which we do it. But they don't pay the, they're not paying interest on a billion dollars instantly as soon as they've negotiated the loan. They pay interest on the proportion of the loan they've accessed so far. And the same thing applies to you with credit cards and the same to how to um, overdrafts and so on. You pay for what you've accessed. You don't pay, unless you're very stupid, in terms of the loan contract you negotiate, you don't pay for what you haven't yet accessed in the loan. So it will be a small amount of money will fall into that category, but it's tiny compared to the bulk which you pay interest on once you've accessed that proportion of the loan. So, um, and that's what turns up in the Federal Reserve data as well. Um, and the Minsky model, you had two questions there, I forgot. Yeah. Can I yeah. Just one more? Yeah. But then is, is this expenditure, it's automatically creating incomes as well for people? Yeah. So how is there a differentiation? I still don't see. Okay, how is it even, even in continuous time, because yeah. now all this debt that's being created, yeah. that's, uh, that's, being s that's spent as it's created, as you're yeah. saying, is automatically generating income. Thank you. Yeah. So you have not necessarily identified. Use the microphone? Yeah, oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> there's a necessary identity. I don't see how debt gets added to any side of Well, the, the change in debt is what's financing both the expenditure and the income. Okay. They're all simultaneously, in that sense, equal to each other. But the change in debt is what enables you to spend the money and is what becomes income for the person you've bought something off. Okay. It's a, well, th think if you, go, if you take your credit card and go shopping through credit card, let's say you go and buy a a, a new um, computer. You know, you swipe the card. Your debt gets increased by a thousand euro. The shop gets a thousand euro at the same time. So the change in debt is your expenditure and is the income for the shop. Okay. We might come back to that one later. Uh, on the Minsky model and the parameters, whose question that was. Um, that's a very important problem that I haven't yet had a chance to tackle practically myself. But if you look at wh how this has been done by uh, meteorologists and hydrologists, who are the two major groups of applied sciences that have actually done this, they've developed a whole area they call nonlinear parameter estimation. Now, it's like, it's like a very sophisticated version of ordinary least squares. But you have techniques. Have you heard of it? What's, what's called uh, the runge cutter algorithm? Okay. When you do it, the simulations I'm doing there are using what's called the runge cutter algorithm, which is like a fifth order Taylor series. You know, you, know what, you, know what a, um, you know what an Euler approximation is to a function? Okay. Well, an Euler approximation takes the tangent to a curve at a point and then uses that an approximation to the curve and then corrects for the next step and so on. That generates enormous errors over time if you compound that. So the runge cutter algorithm is called an adaptive runge cutter algorithm approximates a curve very accurately by what starts off as a third or fifth or fourth or fifth order Taylor series expansion and then has all sorts of error correction mechanisms in the middle. The Gaussian uh, renormalization is done at every time step. That lets you approximate a complex system accurately with approximation techniques. A generalization of that is called the levenberg marquardt uh, process. And what that does is imagines you've got a very complicated uh, landscape and you're trying to find the tallest mountain in a very complicated landscape, where the landscape is the, the, like the height of a function you're trying to maximise, given a, a whole range of parameters that determine that scale. Now, you're not going to, you could never exhaustively search the entire space. What Levenberg Marquardt does is effectively take a particular point, jolt you, and move to another location, and then compare the two, and then try to approximate what is probably the highest point in the landscape, but not definitively so. So, that's one of the techniques for. Uh, for working out parameters for a system like this. There are other ones called simulated annealing. 
which is like imagining you've melted a metal and then you let it cool again and you work out the points of maximum you know, solidity of the, of the metal and what are called genetic algorithms and genetic programming. And again, what they involve is with genetic algorithms, you make, uh, you have a, a bit string that indicates a particular combination of parameters. And if you wanted to exhaust the entire bit string, you would need a computer that could run for the age of the universe to work out even a simple model like mine. But you, by jumping, um, it's like flipping genes, you know, from blue eye to brown eye. Uh, and just seeing which one is closer to being the realistic value for the parameter. So you can fit this data moderately well uh, to actual the models to actual data. The challenge is that with a nonlinear system, even if you actually know the system and you use one of these techniques and you try to approximate, you will get it wrong. So you just can't get an, a totally accurate match because Nonlinear systems are so volatile compared to linear, you can still make mistakes when you try to do it. So you need a certain amount of modesty about the parameter setting. But what I find remarkable is I made those numbers up, just sort of, you know, what, what sort of makes sense as a level and it works. So that to me implies there's a huge amount of what you can call low-hanging fruit by moving from an equilibrium thinking approach to a dynamic approach because the neoclassicals can't explain the crisis, they can't explain the great moderation, you know, it's all a mystery. I whack together a model with nine simple parameters and I get the great moderation and the great recession. So there's a, it, it's as big an advance in that sense of going from Ptolemy's model of the universe, where you can accurately predict where the planets are going to be, but you've got a totally loony model of the solar system, to a very simple model which might be wrong in terms of its parameters, but it gets the basic structure right, that the planets revolve around the Earth. So there's a lot to be gained, but there's still that, that issue is a technically difficult and challenging one. And there's lots of, in terms of programming Minsky, there's lots of programming time to make it possible to, to fit that data, or make, make it approximate to the data. Why, and why exp replace this sort of stuff with DSGE? DSGE is like Ptolemy's model of the universe, with one exception. It doesn't model the universe accurately. Like the advantage of the Ptolemaic system, where you had the Earth at the centre, and the planets circling around almost the Earth, and having and the planets being on circles on circles, that could accurately predict where the planets are going to be for a thousand years. Okay? So it was bloody accurate, given the technology that I was. It was a magnificent piece of work. It was totally wrong about the nature of the universe. Okay? And if we'd stuck with Ptolemy, we would, we, I would be giving a presentation. I'd be chipping marble, you know, on the screen rather than showing PowerPoint. Maybe that might be an improvement. Uh, but. We've progressed dramatically by having models of the universe that are structurally accurate. And I believe the same thing about economics. We simply have to be, if we model st with the structural accuracy, we are more likely to uncover what actually happens here than having structurally completely delusional models as the basis of how we think about the economy. And then once you do it as well, you, the advantage of this sort of stuff, it, com it comes down to, you, economists have to deal with policy makers. And at the moment, if policymakers see a, a neoclassical model, they haven't got a clue what they're looking at. And they, you, could, you, you can't explain to a policymaker why this, if you make a change here, it will have this impact here. There's just no way you can do it. With one of these models, you can read them through the steps and say, here's how the system works. Now you try to simulate it and you try to manage it. And you try your policy out and see what happens. And of course, what you will get quite frequently is the direct policy they try to achieve, like, for example, reducing government deficits will actually make the system more volatile. So I think it's worthwhile in that sense. But uh, fundamentally, we're, we're trying to understand capitalism. And this way of modelling it actually lets you model its structure properly, rather than having a mythical model involving optimising agents and equilibrium. And that's got to be an improvement. But convincing central bankers of that, that's going to be a struggle. I know. I'll find out in two weeks' time how well I do. Hi. Um, I'd like to ask you to elaborate a little bit more on the trigger of the financial crisis because uh, as far as I understood your model, there's not really uh, an exogenous trigger or anything. The, the model in itself at some point uh, generates the, the crisis uh, endogenously, if I, if I understood it correctly. Um, and in contrast to that, um, from my uh, 
reading of some of Minsky's papers, I had the impression that in Minsky's approach, he still needs some kind of exogenous trigger. For example, the central bank raising interest rates and that finally uh, lets the bubble burst. And I don't know, maybe you can say a bit more about this trigger problem. I, I would like uh, if you could to stress a little bit m a little bit about the difference of your research towards the, this one that were that get to be very known the the one from Carmen and Hogoff Reinhardt and Ho Hogoff because uh, there's some there's some uh, s one uh, at least one point that it seems uh, interesting comparisons because you're trying to find a threshold to the uh, private uh, debt and how does it affect growth and the crisis. And the other uh, research of them, they are trying to find the same threshold but regarding to public investments. So, to public debt, sorry. And so I'd like you to make this comparison, especially because they strictly present the, the difference between uh, net debt and gross debt and you didn't make this very clear. I would like to wonder, I, I wonder why and if you could explain that to us. And the second question I would like to to ask you, uh, it's about the, the the solution you propose that it seems quite uh, new and interesting. That is quantitative uh, easing for the people. You said, and I wonder. Uh, 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 there's also some uh, proposals uh, regarding some kind of other quantitative easing, but regarding to the public treasure, for example. So, uh, for example, Japan right now, the the central bank is financing directly the treasure. And how do you think there is this relation of public policies or public mm -hmm. strategies of the central bank? Uh, yeah, OK. So um, your question on the trigger. Is there any other question <laughs> right now? Or? There can be a trigger. Because the sense, and the, I think the Federal Reserve is going to pull the trigger itself in the next a few months because they're going to put up interest rates, uh, believing that they can, they've got to tame a growing economy. And they, all they are looking at the price effect of interest rates, they have no idea there's a quantity effect because they ignore the role of private debt. Okay? So there is going to be a trigger in that sense. And I think the Federal Reserve will trigger a downturn in the American economy next year by doing that. So you can have an external trigger. Uh, but what my model generates is endogenous turning points. And this is the whole, I think, about a complex system. Uh, if you are your expectations of profit depend upon current conditions and you will therefore invest on the basis of those current conditions. And Minsky talks about euphoric investments occurring. So if you have a very high rate of profit, capitalists are likely to want to borrow a lot of money to finance that. When they borrow that money and finance the investment, they cause a boom. The boom will change the distribution of income because it will mean more workers get jobs and they can therefore demand higher wage rises. It'll also increase demand for commodities, so it drives up commodity prices, which changes the internal distribution of income and means capitalists don't get the profit they thought they were going to get. And therefore, their servicing, debt servicing problems are more extreme than they thought, so they have less profit and you get an endogenous turning point. And that's, I think it's incredibly important to get endogenous dynamics into our models. And it comes out of this extremely simply. The model, has anybody read Goodwin's um, papers, Richard Goodwin? Okay, take a look for Richard Goodwin because what I've done, that, that model of mine is based on Goodwin's 1967 paper called The Growth Cycle and I simply added debt into it. As it happens, Minsky and Goodwin were both colleagues at the University of um, Washington, I think, and they didn't like each other. And um, they also, um, Goodwin had convinced himself that money didn't matter, whereas Minsky said money is the only important thing. So they never got together and collaborated. And I, I disagreed with Goodwin. We had a personal correspondence over this. And he told me, don't model money. And I said, I'm going to model money. So what I did in effect was combine these two guys who were sitting in offices next to each other. And by doing it, Goodwin had the idea of endogenous cycles. He's by far the most important person in the history of, non -econo of economics for building cyclical models of the economy. So if you want to learn how to do this sort of stuff I'm talking about, read Goodwin. He's hard to read. He doesn't write all that well, but he's by far the most gifted person looking at the endogenous dynamics in capitalism.
So you, you, if you can't explain it endogenously, you don't really have an explanation. And I think Minsky relied upon external triggers, largely because he didn't have the mathematical sophistication that Goodwin had. But Goodwin was always looking for something endogenous to cause turning points. And the major turning point in his model was a changing level of rate of growth of the economy, causing changes in income distribution, which then undermine capitalist expectations and cause a cycle. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, use the microphone. But how do you reconcile this explanation that the, the profit share declines during the boom with the fact that the profit share has been rising in, in the in the great moderation the way The way we describe the profit share, we lump in bankers' profits with it. And that's fallacious. If you, if you take out the fire sector, finance, insurance and real estate, the profit level has not been rising. Industrial capitalism's profit rate's been falling. So what I'm modelling here, effectively separating the finance sector from the real sector, and you have to do that to model capitalism properly. That's what I regard Graziani's work. Have you ever read Graziani? Uh, look for Graziani, the paper, The Monetary Theory of Production. Uh, he was very emphatic that you had to treat capitalist industrial firms and, and, and the banking sector as quite separate. And what we do in our stats is we tend to lump them together. But if you separate out the two, there hasn't been rising profits for the industrial sector. There's been actually declining profits for the industrial sector and more than compensating rising profits for the financial sector. Um, and on Rainer Hutton Rogoff, um, talk about sloppy research. I mean, you saw the way they were shot down by, um, uh, by UMass, spreadsheet errors, uh, bad aggregation of data, et cetera, et cetera. And like most neoclassicals, they simply see public, public is bad, private is good, you know. So public that is bad, private good that they ignored to some extent. Uh, certainly in that paper, that, that categorical paper of theirs, they were just looking at public debt and that was it. Um, they were looking for levels that mattered. To me, public debt is a symptom. Public debt rises in the aftermath of a crisis. So I can show you plenty of data on that front. That, for example, Spain was absolutely the poster boy of the euro because it was the only country that qualified to be a member of the euro. Okay. It had its debt level when the euro began was private government debt was below 60% of GDP and it ran a deficit of less than 3% for the whole of 2000s uh, and actually ran a surplus for various years until the crisis hit. Now its debt's exploded. So rising public debt is a symptom of a private debt crisis. And that's, that's the, the difference with me and Rogoff on that front. And let's see, the, the quantitative easing. Uh, what we've had is quantitative easing has been basically the, the, the central bank buying dodgy assets off the private banks which means they swap a dodgy asset, which they probably overprice and make a profit out of and selling to the central bank. They swap that for reserves. So what you've got going on with standard QE is an asset swap. It's all happening on the asset side of the banking sector. That, of course, encourages them to, because they've got reserves they can't um, make money out of, that encourages the banks to buy shares. Okay? If they do buy shares, then the people who they buy the shares off put their money back in the banks again, so there's no change in the excess reserves, but the banks have swapped their assets around from being reserves and um, bonds that they've originated to reserve bonds and shares. And that's inflated asset prices dramatically. But the amount of money that's actually dribbled into the economy then turns, depends upon the turnover of what's happening in the finance sector. So for all those transactions, people will be clipping. Have anybody, have you seen The Wolf on Wall Street? Yeah, great movie, eh? Remember the guy talked about clipping? We clip every time. That's the, on the only part of QE that's actually turned up on the real economy is all that clipping. You know, so they go out and buy some more cocaine or God knows whatever else they buy and snort it away and by paying to the dealer they get some money into the street. But that, that's been the trivial level in which QE's actually injected money into private bank accounts. Now if we use the government's, the, the central bank's capacity to create money to say that they effectively put money in the depo our deposit accounts, that turns up on the reserve side of the banks as well, but it inflates both their reserves and their, their assets and their liabilities. And by inflating their, their liabilities, there's more money in circulation directly. So you can get something like 50 or 100 times the bank for your buck by people's QE than you get out of the type of QE that 
has been practiced so far. But of course they won't do it because that's going to lead to Zimbabwe. I'm joking. But that's the sort of nonsense answer you get whenever you suggest this. Oh, one more. There's always one more just at the last minute. Yeah. I think it's a rule of mathematics. Uh, I want to <coughs> I want to ask you about the, the institution of debt jubilee. Pardon? About the institution of debt jubilee. Yeah, yeah. Uh, taking into account uh, how deep rooted are in our societies the the concept of death and uh, the moral aspect, the historical moral aspect related to, to debt uh, and the misunderstanding of the, the process in, uh, in which uh, uh, death is created. Uh, do you think that is feasible, feasible in, uh, in, uh, in the next future, mm. bringing yeah. this back? Yeah. And also I want to ask you, uh, how, do you how do you see currently the, the, uh, the anti-debt movements in the south of Europe? Uh, claiming for the public debt cancellation? Yeah, um, good questions. Um, the, the real bar barrier... Uh, pardon? Okay. Yeah, I, I guess um, all the talk about debt, I'm just wondering what some of the political implications could be of this model, particularly if it's taken up by right-wing people. Um, I, you take the model and say that debt jubilee is the way to go but i can also see how you could come up with we need massive reduction in public debts and public deficits whatever the cost and using this model to lead to a justification of austerity um and po even structural adjustment so i was wondering if you could kind of talk more about that yeah um that that i can just directly contradict because if you include public spending in my model which i do and there's a more elaborate version than this then the public spending counteracts the crisis. And if you try to, in fact, I've set it up uh, so if you actually let the government control the unemployment rate it reacts to, and it looks at the deficit and think that's too high, so it's going to reduce the level of unemployment it worries about, you know, tolerate 10% rather than 5% unemployment, the government debt ratio actually rises. Because what you do in the system, it undermines GDP more than it reduces debt directly. So this sort of model could be used to show to a conservative politician, have them attempt to do what they think is important, which is reduce government debt, and the economy goes to hell in a handbasket, and their government debt rate level rises as well. So that's the, that's the advantage of a, this, this, the approach I'm using here is called system dynamics overall. And it really means you get a, an interlocking model where everything depends upon everything else. And rather than ceteris paribus, the neoclassical fantasy, if everything you change changes something else in the system. So you have got a complex feedback system. And it would show you, if you played with it, that doing the direct trying to reduce government debt will make the system worse. Okay? It, it shows the consequences of doing that. So it would actually be a way against the right wing. What worries me on the right versus left front is that the right wing is far more likely to come along and abolish debt than the left is. And the right is far more likely to tell the Euro where, Euro, European Union where to get off than the left was. So I, and what worry, that's what concerns me about Syriza and what's happened might be happening in Podemos in Spain as well. Um, the left can get rolled by the European Union if you've got groups like Golden Dawn becoming the government of Greece. They quite happily say, we're writing off all our debt. If you don't like it, come here and try to take it back. You know? So to me, that's the real political danger of this, not the right using this to argue for austerity, but the extreme right using this to abolish, to say, let's write all private debt off completely, and then succeeding economically because they did the right thing, and bringing in all their fascist policies on top of it, which is what we happened back in the 1930s. A major reason for the success of Hitler was he wrote off all Germany's debt. Okay. Then the Nazis bought the debt, bought the bonds back cheaply when the market collapsed as well. By the way, um, the debt jubilee and the moral aspects of it. I'm, I'm glad to see a lot of groups campaigning for a debt jubilee now. The main problem they face is that people do have this moral attitude, you should pay your debts. Okay. And that really comes back to treating debt as being interpersonal. Like if I borrowed your watch to tell the time, you won't give it to me. <laughs> and didn't return it, I've stolen his watch, which he had to earn the money to, to, 
to get. So David would be quite wrong in saying I'm morally reprehensible because I stole his watch. Okay. Uh, but banks don't have to save to lend the money. They create it in double entry bookkeeping terms. And as soon as people get to realise it's simply a case of making entry in two columns that creates the money, then you can say, well, you put the wrong entries there. It's, it's not a case of morally the debtor has to pay you back because the debtor's robbed you. So you made a stupid mistake to create more money than you should have. So let's find a systemic way to reduce it without causing bad consequences for everybody else. My favourite example there, and you can find this if you go searching on the web, there's a New Zealand petrol station owner who applied for an overdraft with Westpac Bank back in 2011, I think. And he applied for a $100,000 overdraft. And when he went, he got approved. This is, comes back to the question you asked about the with money created as well. He checked his bank account the next day and he had an overdraft of $10 million. What had happened? You know, have, if you've ever seen a bank computer keyboard, they've all got double zero keys. Okay. I think he went to type 100,000 dot double zero and either dot jammed or he didn't press the dot key, the clerk had created it. So rather than creating $100,000 of debt capacity for this guy, he created 10 million. Okay? And it took one less keystroke to create 100 times as much money. You find any other industry where you can do 9% you know, less work and create 100 times as much stuff. Banking is unique on that front. What he did was he, hopped in, he, he took out 7 million and hopped on a plane and flew to China. At which point, at point, uh, point uh, Westpac went after him and he finally ended up being extradited back to New Zealand. He's now serving a, a lengthy jail term. But, you know, that literally, the, by, by, by one less keystroke, created 100 times as much money. That makes the point it's not about moral in that sense, it's, it's institutional. So if, if we get people to understand that, then they're going to be more willing to say, yes, we should write debt off. And let's also do it in a way that doesn't affect third parties. Because if we did write that debt off by paying debt down, as you were saying earlier, then we'd actually cause a slump in the economy. So you have to say, reducing the debt on, on its own will reduce demand. So we have to do something compensating to match for that reduction in demand. And that's where the modern debt jubilee would mean you'd be giving savers additional money, which they could spend to compensate for the reduction in money by cancelling the debt of the debtors. So that's, that's why I think it's so important to get these accounting type concepts through. Um, let's see another part of that question. Is it feasible? Uh, possibly not in my lifetime, but I hope in yours. Because if you look at the state of, um, of Japan, Japan has been caught in a slump now for one quarter of a, a century. They still talk about Japan's lost decade, but its lost decade began in 1990. And it's still in a slump. It's, it's a very comfortable slump for Jer because it's a major exporter and there's demographic change population falling and they're quite comfortable. G GDP per capita is still rising. But their GDP has been stagnant for one quarter of a century. Now if you bring it across to the rest of the world which is now in the same situation, for a start Japan man managed to maintain itself by running huge f fiscal deficits which you won't get happening in Europe. It also sustained itself by huge trade surpluses, which you won't get in most of Europe except Germany. So we're more likely to have a more severe downturn than Japan had. And we've got nowhere near as socially cohesive a society as Japan is. So if the crisis hits in the Western world, we're going to have a rise of racism, a rise of you know, conflict between nations, all that sort of garbage. And I think ultimately we, we have to find a way out of this and the Jubilee is probably the only effective way of doing it. So I hope it wins, but it will take a huge political struggle. And it also comes down to the youth. You guys are the ones who are being disenfranchised by the level of debt. So that's what's causing asset prices to be as high as they are, meaning you can't afford to buy housing. If you drop the level of mortgage debt dramatically, you drop house prices dramatically too. So you could afford to buy houses again. So there's a huge age political issue here as well as social class. And it takes it would take a change of consciousness amongst the young to realize this is actually a serious issue and attack this and reduce the level of inequality because the huge part of the inequality again comes out of the debt leverage whether it'll happen I don't know um, the anti-debt movement in South Europe is in touch with me at various times I'm just hoping they manage to, to win the case but 
we really have to change how people think about debt. And that's twofold. Going away from the obsession about public debt, which is the mistake that Rogoff and all the neoclassicals make. Uh, public debt is not dangerous to the same degree that private debt is, because it's only the, it, it's the instrumental effect of that debt that matters. Does it cause inflation? Does it cause a trade deficit? Those sorts of questions. There's no inability of the government to create the debt or to finance it. Okay? Whereas in the private sector, there is a difficulty in financing that debt, and that's what causes the problems. And what people have to get in their heads is the government is the only institution that owns its own bank. That's why it's got no problem in that sense, unless it does irresponsible things with the money. Whereas the private sector does not own its own bank and can end up in the financial trap we're in now. <laughs> um, I have a question, a uh, little political, about the further integration of the European Union. I want to ask if the further integration of the European Union and the creation of the free markets actually uh, creates favorable circumstances for the private debt because it increases the money transactions between countries. Mm. Yeah, and one of, one of Keynes is on. Oh, you're sorry, Keynes. It's probably going to be the rest, last round because mm. maybe it's getting light. probably depends on. Okay, I'm going to uh, ask something about the uh, Asian economy. And it suddenly uh, hit me that um, around 1999 and 2006, uh, Japan and Taiwan, we all had the um, uh, economic stimulus program, which is that uh, the government. Uh, gave the um, gave the people the um, the free voucher, and for Taiwan it's like equal around a uh, hundred USD dollar um a hundred and twenty USD dollars, and the government although they will um they have to increase the debt, but for uh, for people we have the like free voucher and to we can purchase uh, purchase whatever we want, and uh, um, after because we had this program after Japan, but for Japan they had a, a very bad a very negative comment because uh, it uh, I I remember that because uh, for Japan it, they don't they don't have to like uh, really stimulate GDP for but for Taiwan we really. Uh, did have the very positive uh, GDP and economic growth. And what do you think, uh, why there are very uh, different cases of these two countries? Yeah, I don't know Taiwan's debt situation, so I can't answer that with respect, but I can look it up, I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. So back to the first one about the single union. I think that actually was a major reason why we've got a huge crisis in Europe. It wasn't just the Maastricht Treaty itself, uh, but the Maastricht Treaty was an insanely bad treaty. Uh, the, the limits on government debt, limits on deficits were entire. As Wynne Godley argued back in 1992, uh, people who brought that in would have to believe capitalism is a self-stabilizing system. And since it's not, when a crisis strikes, this will make the crisis worse rather than better. Have you read Wynne Godley's uh, paper, 1990, uh, Maastricht and all that? If those of you haven't seen it, search for the name Godley. I'm sure you know Wynne Godley's name and a paper called Maastricht and all that he wrote back in 1992, just observing what's likely to happen in Europe courtesy of the Maastricht Treaty. So that's one side of it. But the other side is that it did, as you say, it enabled finance to internationalise itself throughout Europe. So you had French and German banks lending to Swiss and to Swedish and, I'm um, sorry, to um, Spanish and Italian and, and uh, Greek companies on very, very low interest rates because of the original stabilisation sequence. That meant that you had, as well as having the fiscal strains that Maastricht put Europe under, you also had finance being dramatically internationalised and huge financial flows on top of that were enabled by the single union. And one of Keynes's most interesting comments, which most people don't know, is he said, above all else, let finance be national. In other words, he saw incredible dangers with finance being internationalised, and the euro was a major part of internationalising finance. So it enabled these mega banks to form. If you had national banking systems, you couldn't have had banks on the same scale as you got over you know, HSBC and Deutsche Bank and all those banks lending across national boundaries. And that tends to homogenise what they do. They go on, end up being on, on credit scoring systems like that to decide whether to create loans rather than knowing their own businesses. So. Richard Werner, do you know the name Richard Werner? Richard's another 
non-orthodox thinker on money like, uh, like me, Richard focuses very much on the need to create community banks and things like that and go back to small-scale banking. So definitely that made things worse. On Taiwan versus Japan, I don't know Taiwan's private debt situation. Japan's is, was astronomical. Um, that stimulus in Japan, if it didn't actually reduce the private debt levels, would just have added to the government deficit without changing the overall dynamics of debt. Taiwan it could have been more stimulatory with a lower level of private debt. So um, I'll need to look at the data to be sure. If you want to see the data, the Bank of International Settlements has now produced a really fantastic database uh, where they've got private debt broken down by household, uh, non-financial non corporation and government. And they've got debt to GDP ratios, debt in nominal uh, terms, debt in US dollars, incredibly de detailed database. So you can make all the comparisons you need out of that BIS database. So I suggest if you want to check the empirics, get hold of that BIS data and check it out. Okay, thank you. Hmm.